So uh, next we're gonna be hearing from Martin Kakainis for uh, about an improved quantum algorithm for variable time quantum search. Great, thank you so much for, for the introduction. Uh, this is our joint work with Andrew Sambainis and Yaugenis Vichros, also from the University of Latvia. Uh, so what is uh, what's variable time search? Variable time search is a type of quantum search where we allow for the situation that some items to be checked require more time than other. And as a warm-up, uh, let us uh, recall the Grover search, so n items, square root of n iterations, right? And if we spend, um, say, time t for each iteration, uh, then this gives us uh, the following, uh, this following uh, kind of uh, quantum algorithm. And that basically assumes that for each item we, uh, we spend the same time checking it. But it might be not the case. What if some items here are more easier to, more easy to check them uh, than others? In fact, that is not uncommon in many applications. Um, say we have this kind of distribution of times uh, per each item. Uh, how does that affect, uh, affect such complexity? Uh, we could always, of course, uh, pretend that uh, all items are equally costly and simply allocate the same time for each of them, the maximal among all of them. Uh, but that really means that we pretend that uh, all items uh, cost this much, and uh, yeah, then, we, then we recover these uh, growers uh, kind of search. Mm, but it's probably not a very efficient idea. In fact, it can be quite far from efficient. So can we do better? And this is where the variable time search algorithms step in. Uh, they try to solve this search problem in time which depends on this quantity, sum of squared individual times. In case all of them are equal, uh, then square root of capital T recovers uh, the complexity of Grover search. More generally, uh, using square root of capital T means that instead of this maximal time, we use the quadratic average of all the individual running times. And basically, these variable time search algorithms come in two flavors. Uh, well, the simplest case is the known uh, times case, when for each item, we know beforehand how much time it will require. And we can use that information to design the quantum algorithm, and then indeed, uh, there is a quite simple quantum algorithm achieving this complexity, square root of capital T, and of course there's a matching lower bound, so this is essentially optimal. But probably a more realistic and having more applications is the case uh, when we do not know uh, before how much time each item will require, and uh, we only discover it by checking res the respective item. And uh, at least prior to this work, the best known lower bound was still uh, of the same order, the square root of t, that comes from the known times, of course, um, from that case. Um, but the algorithms actually have a polylog overhead. Back in 2006, uh, there was given algorithm with such a complexity. Let's just say it was a bit involved. A few years later, it was improved. Um, so um, the logarithmic dependence uh, was uh, uh, better and also less complicated, um, but the algorithm is still quite, uh, quite involved. Um, basically, it uh, works recursively um, by running some trivial search procedure, estimating its success probability by amplitude estimation, uh, then uh, performing amplitude amplification, running checking procedure, again estimating the amplitude, amplifying it based on that estimate, and so on and so on. And uh, yeah, this kind of algorithm is um, difficult to even describe, even harder to analyze, never mind any sort of implementation. Um, yeah, so the, this um, summarizes uh, what was previously known, and despite all the difficulties, variable time search, especially in the unknown times case, is actually quite a, uh, quite a useful thing, and it has appeared as a subroutine in quite a few algorithms. Uh, and it is especially useful when the problem at hand can be recast as, uh, can be subdivided into several branches or subproblems with possibly very different costs. 
then variable time search allows to uh, merge these solutions in efficient enough way. And our contribution is twofold. First of all, we, uh, we show a simpler variable time search algorithm. Uh, in particular, it uses only amplitude amplification without necessity to perform amplitude estimation steps. And that, among other things, allows for uh, tight analysis of this algorithm, improving, improving this complexity. Uh, but it all comes with a cost um, because this algorithm assumes that we know an upper bound on the sum of squares. And secondly, we also show an improved lower bound for the unknown times case, uh, basically showing that square root of t is not achievable and this is indeed intrinsically more difficult case than that of known times. And uh, so in, th in this model we assume that we have access to this type of checking circuit um, basically, the second register uh, stores uh, after t time units either the answer bit or an indicator that the computation did not terminate, we need more time. And we basically assume that this answer bit is computed by uh, some sort of uh, exact algorithm invoked by this checking circuit. Uh, and yeah, in this talk, we focus on the case when uh, uh, the algorithms. Uh, computing this ice answer bit are exact, but it's, it is not much of a restriction. We can deal with the bounded error case uh, with, uh, similarly with some appropriate modifications. And our goal is to construct an algorithm which finds one of the solutions or declares that no such solution exists. We will allow this algorithm to consist of two types of transformations, either these checking circuits for, uh, for, uh, for different times t, or some intermediate unitaries that do not depend on the answer bit x. And uh, for simplicity, we will assume that uh, only these uh, checking circuits uh, matter for complexity. That is, uh, the complexity will be the total time spent by running these checking circuits. And these intermediate unitaries are free of charge. So what is, uh, what is the algorithm? Uh, we construct actually two algorithms. One for the simplest case when we know how much, how many solutions there are, uh, or at least a good bound on this, uh, this uh, number. And the general case then is obtained um, by a standard technique, uh, running uh, the previous algorithm repeatedly. And in both cases, uh, we, we require the upper bound on the sum of squares to be known. So this is a limitation of our, our approach here. And the, most important and basic tool we use is amplitude amplification, of course. In its basic form, amplitude amplification works like this. And so suppose we have a unitary mapping some initial states to a state which consists of the good part, of the successful part, the part we want, and some remaining for the bad part. And typically, the amplitude as the good part is small, so we wish to amplify it so to make this um, probability to measure a state from this part uh, large, and uh, uh, amplitude amplification allows to multiply this angle by, a, uh, by an odd factor. Uh, and it does so by invoking this initial unitary as many times, mm -hmm. the initial unitary or its inverse. And if we knew alpha, then we could uh, choose k large enough to make this angle close to pi over two, uh, much like in Grover search, Mm, but actually, in our applications, we do not need that. We use this merely to triple the angle, um, so to obtain uh, uh, this kind of amplification. And the other form of amplitude amplification, perhaps more widely used, is this. So suppose we do not need, uh, know this angle alpha, but we have some guarantees, some lower bound on the success probability of the initial algorithm. Uh, then we can boost this uh, success probability uh, to an arbitrary threshold one minus delta uh, by invoking the initial algorithm this many times. Uh, so, how do we construct an algorithm when uh, the number of solutions is known? Um, we, we will define recursively a sequence of times and procedures. A sequence of times is very simply defined with a t of one equal to this, three times square root of t over n. What it achieves is that T1 is at least three times the quadratic average of all the running individual running times. 
and each subsequent time step is three times larger than, uh, than the previous one. And we do so until we exceed the square root of capital T. And the first, uh, first checking procedure, sorry, the first procedure we define uh, is uh, such that we create this superposition over um, all the indices. Uh, we run the checking procedure for this first time step. And that results in this kind of state where the second register uh, is either the answer or an indicator that more time is necessary for the ith item. And each subsequent uh, procedure amplifies the state of the, the result of the previous procedure and runs checking circuit uh, for the next time step. To amplify uh, the amplitude, we must define what is our good part. And for us, uh, the good part is, uh, consists of those, uh, those states uh, that have either indicator e equal to one, so this i solution, or equal to the this star, this indicator that more time is necessary, which means that I still has a potential to be a solution. Or in other words, uh, we triple the angle at the good parts of the state, and then we triple the checking time. And this recursive uh, tripling uh, succeeds in logarithmic number of stages. Uh, so after this many stages, uh, uh, this amplitude uh, at the solutions is uh, amplified far enough, and we find one of the solutions with constant probability. And of course, uh, then we can boost that probability to one minus delta with logarithmic number of rounds. So basically, this is how this simple procedure works, and that results in the algorithm of the claimed complexity. And when we do not know how many solutions there are, or if any, uh, then, uh, uh, then we don't know how many stages we need to run, and we simply try uh, increasing, um, increasing uh, values of this L, which corresponds to exponentially decreasing guesses for N. Uh, the problem is that um, this previous algorithm, if we run it for too long, its success probability will decrease, and to deal with that, we we will rerun, before increasing the value for L, we rerun uh, this uh, simple procedure with all the smaller values for the number of stages. So basically, the overall algorithm then looks like this. When we repeat a uh, uh, simple procedure with one stage, with two stages, and so on, before increasing to three stages. Mm. And this, and of course, if any of the simple procedure returns a solution, we stop and uh, on the other hand, if we get that far and no solution was found, we declare that no solution exists. And we show that uh, uh, this uh, algorithm indeed uh, um, finds a solution if one exists uh, with constant probability and expected complexity of this order. And on the other hand, if there are no solutions, uh, this algorithm answers correctly if there are none uh, with certainty and in this many time steps. And for the lower bound, uh, we show that any quantum algorithm solving the variable time search uh, problem with unknown times must take at least square root of t log t uh, time steps. And for a high level overview how to do that, we will define a function in query computational model which can be computed by a variable time search uh, algorithm. Um, but it comes with a twist that the running times uh, are themselves encoded by the particular input for this function. And uh, so uh, to parameterize this complexity in terms of capital T, we fix its value and restrict our attention to those inputs where this uh, times squared uh, gives this fixed value. And so this capital T is known, but the uh, individual times are still unknown. And we prove that the quantum query complexity is of the necessary order, and then uh, from that we can uh, conclude that any, any uh, variable time search algorithm for unknown times must spend at least as many, many time steps. Uh, so how, to, how to define such a function? Uh, uh, the, the most important tool we use here is p-search function, 
which is uh, quite convenient for lower bounds. Uh, so p such function mm, is defined on strings from this alphabet and on strings where there's only one, uh, only single uh, non-star element. And this non-star element then is the value of the p such function. And our function f is simply the composition of or and the p such function. So uh, function f is one if and only if uh, at least one of these p such instances ev evaluates to one. And more formally, of course, uh, we will describe this function defined as on a subset of strings. Uh, at this point, it is useful to think of um, uh, a valid input for f as a matrix uh, consisting of n rows. In each row, we have a single non-star element and function is one if and only if uh, there is a row containing a one, at least one such a row. And the thing is, uh, in each row, we can, uh, we can find uh, this non-star element um, by making uh, only this many queries, uh, the square, no, uh, square root of the position, and it's achieved basically by a variant of Grover search. So we find uh, the value of the p-search in each row with certainty in square root of, uh, uh, of, the, of the position. And that gives us a, an instance uh, quite use, uh, where the variable time search uh, uh, algorithms are quite useful because uh, for different rows we can have widely different, uh, different running times. Uh, the different times uh, required by the algorithm to find the answer, and we can combine these solutions by variable time search algorithm with these times which are themselves dependent on the input x. Oh, so to, we will fix the, the value of the capital T and restrict our function to, the, to those inputs where these running time squared sum up to capital T. Uh, so any Variable time search algorithm, of course, must spend at least as much time as uh, the quantum query complexity of this partial function. And uh, we show that for certain values of n and m, for these parameters uh, used to define the function, uh, indeed, the query complexity is of the necessary order. It comes uh, with an uh, intrinsic argument uh, about the adversary bound of such a function. Oh, well, to re recap. Uh, we showed a simpler variable time search algorithm uh, with improved complexity. Uh, in particular, we proved that there is no overamplification in this algorithm, which spares us from the uh, amplitude estimation steps. And uh, uh, this comes with a stronger assumption uh, than previous algorithm. Instead of discovering this uh, sum by, um, by amplitude estimation or similar techniques, we, this upper bound must be given to our algorithm now. And um, well, we also showed an improved lower bound. So this shows that square root of t is not achievable for, for the unknown times case. And this is in, indeed a more difficult case than the case when the known times, when the times are known. And uh, of course, there's still a gap between the upper and lower bounds. And so this an interesting question, which, which one wins, if any. Uh, we think that the lower bound could be still improved because uh, the current proof uh, currently um, enforces some kind of distribution of these individual running times. And probably a quantum algorithm could uh, exploit that. So perhaps a more, uh, some more general construction allowing more general distribution of times uh, could, uh, could lead to a better better lower bound. I will wrap up here. Thank you so much for your attention. And also thank you to the local organizers for all your hard work setting up this wonderful event. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for the talk. Um, are there any questions? You said you needed to have no abound on T ahead of time. Mm, sorry? You said you need to have a, a, an upper bound on big T ahead of time. Yeah. So, that, uh, so I'm wondering why can't you do a similar technique like if you don't know the number of marked items and kind of iterate for 
kind of guess larger and larger values yeah, of T? Like, why does that strategy not work? We, we tried that, but it doesn't quite work. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this complexity is basically sum up uh, wrongly. And uh, th th that was what we first tried, but didn't succeed. Perhaps some more, more delicate argument could help. Does it succeed with just a slightly larger complexity, or it just doesn't, the algorithm fails? Oh, well, the complexity is, uh, the, the complexity is uh, turned out wrong, but uh, I guess it can be quite, quite larger than, than that. Uh, so the, the, the summing didn't work as we hoped. Any other questions? Oh, well, I have a question. Um, so in your model, uh, you consider, like, if I were to run one of the searches for an insufficient amount of time, uh, then I would get a heralded failure. Instead of getting, I found one or I, or I didn't find one, I would get, uh, you didn't run it for long enough, if I understood correctly. Is that right? Uh, sure. Um, I can repeat the question. So, um, say you were to run one of the searches for an insufficient amount of time, uh, then instead of getting, say, I failed to find a marked item, you would get a, you didn't run the algorithm for long enough kind of a signal. Um, did I understand that correctly? Yeah, so, okay, I was wondering, since, I mean, I feel like that would be a fairly common situation, that if I were to run a search for not enough time, say, for example, just Grover search, for example, if I don't run it for long enough, I'm just going to get, uh, oh, I failed to find a marked item kind of a signal. Um, is there any hope to generalizing these methods to this case where, you know, the output of these oracles is just binary rather than ternary? Probably not. not sure. yeah. We kind of really need this, um, this indicator that the computation did not terminate because, um, uh, yeah. Uh, otherwise, of course, we don't know if um, the answer we got is correct or not and um, this, um, this argument breaks down. Um, I guess um, one could ask if we somehow can, can, can verify the answer or, or build, in, build in checking this answer, but uh, on its uh, face value, I don't know how, how to deal with, with the case when the answer is instead of this signal um, an incorrect one. So, so currently, no. I see, okay, that sounds tricky. Um, any other questions? I have another one. <laughs> um, actually, it's a, it's about something that you didn't uh, mention that you mentioned just at the beginning of the talk. So you mentioned that there was you mentioned that there was an application of variable time quantum search for improving the complexity of HHL. Do you have just like a rough intuition as to how that works? Frankly, it's I a little bit unfair of a question because it's not <laughs> about what you presented in the talk. Um, yeah, I'm 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 not uh, very much about. Uh, knowledge about, about that uh, application, but, um, yeah, b basically, okay, I, I remember there, there was uh, this task they subdivided uh, into several parts, but um, I, I really don't know much about that. Um, sorry. I see. No, yeah, no worries, no worries. Yeah. Um, well, uh, if there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker again.